And then it normally says live on Facebook. The meeting is now streaming live on Facebook. Got it. That's absolutely marvellous. So, hello, everybody. I don't know whether you can hear me yet. Let's have a look if it's on my page. Let's have a peep. Because it will be good if it is. And then we can see some comments coming up and stuff like that. So just bear with me for a moment or two. There we are. Press on there. Shut up, shut up. I've thought I'd turned you down. Stop speaking, Joseph. All right. Okay. Yes, it's now on my page. I'm normally at this point going, da -dum, da -diddle -de -doodle -doo, you know, and sing a little song while things get ready. Denise, my love, it's nice to see you. It's wonderful to see you, Joe. And we've never met in person, have we? But it feels like we have. I know. I was just going to say, are you sure? Well, I, I don't know. Well, maybe in no, a we different haven't. sort. No, we haven't. No. Not yet. No, no, because because quite a few years ago, our paths crossed with regard to people who I know in this Merseyside area and stuff like that, if you yeah. remember correctly. Yeah. Who seem to have gone off the scene, actually, for the moment or two. But, you know, that's the way it works. People come into your life and people go, don't they? So thanks very much for turning up and agreeing to come on. I've really got no plan as such, except that the reason I've set this sort of little channel up is for people to come along and maybe share simple, straightforward, practical tips that people may want to do. So it's really about action, not hypothesizing or anything like that. It's just stuff that you've got experience of personally or in your professional career as a nurse for 20 years you know because I know in the little bio that I put up um, you said that you introduced this into a large I think it was a district general hospital or something you know mm. and so go on Denise over to you and just explain who you are I'll do that silly thing you know what's your <laughs> name and where do you come from number two <laughs> people say don't say number two I say where do you come from number one <laughs> Oh, Joe, it's so lovely to share space with you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here. I am delighted to be in your company, in your, I thought that was the real kitchen, but it's not, is it? Either you've got something funny going on with your head or that's not actually a real kitchen. No, it's not. If I, if I turn this off now, you'd see all sorts of underpants on the radiators <laughs> behind and things like that, you know. <laughs> so it's one of them, their backdrops. <laughs> nice. Is that actually your house? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm Denise, as you said, and the work that I do now is very different from the work that I used to do. So I, um, from leaving school, I was a nurse and very, very right brain for, for sorry, very left brain for a long time. Um, quite scientific really in the way that I approached the world and what changed for me so I'd been a nurse for including my training for about 17 17 years at this point and a friend of mine whose judgment I valued who was another nurse had just learnt Reiki so she um she wanted to do Reiki on me and I, I've been resistant to Reiki for quite a while. My, um, my mom was a yoga teacher from me being three years old. So I was introduced to the world of, of yoga um, very early on and she used to put seminars on. And this, you know, this is a long, <laughs> this is a long time ago. This is in the seventies um, or she started in, in the late sixties, giving my age away there. Um, but she used to put seminars on and I do remember posters of chakras. I do remember that that was talked about, but I was very young. I was about, about seven when I used to have to sit in on these, on these weird, weird seminars. Um, so that kind of gave, gave me a bit of a grounding into all this, but then I very much moved away from that. And my mum had been also doing Reiki for a long time and I wouldn't let her anywhere near me with that hocus pocus nonsense. Um, but as I say, my friend Yasmin, whose judgment I valued, I was at a house anyway, we'd had dinner, all I had to do was lie there for an hour, so I was like, okay. And that changed everything. 
receiving Reiki, feeling the energy, feeling the heat from her hands, especially around my throat, which she wasn't even touching, but it was, it was incredible that, that feeling. Um, but the main thing for me was the difference between before and after and all she'd done was put her hands on or above my body for an hour and I felt I felt lighter I felt balanced I didn't know how imbalanced I was until I felt more balanced Mm. um so this was in December 2000 um so that was really life-changing and I bought myself a book on Reiki for for that Christmas and was reading it and was doing it on myself even though I hadn't been attuned but then in the following May so May 2001 I received my level one Reiki attunement and went on a mission to heal the world at that point and tell everybody about it um and I was in a in a position the nursing job that I had at that time um was a nurse teacher so my Reiki master and myself started to put on Reiki study days at the hospital where I worked because this was at Manchester Royal Infirmary and it was a 250 year old hospital it held a lot of energy that wasn't really that great so you'd walk into the building and you'd feel it pressing down on you on your shoulders and and on your body Um, And that that was what we wished to do, to bring the light into that really dark place. So there was a lot of nurses that learned Reiki with us, but there was also a lot of admin staff, catering staff, even a couple of doctors as well. So um, we trained, before I left to move to Australia, we'd we'd attuned something like 167 staff from the hospital. And I, I carried it on. I became a Reiki master in 2003. And my Reiki master, Jacqueline Williams, kind of stepped down a little bit at that point. And I took over the teaching in the hospital until I until I moved to Australia. Um, And I left nursing when I moved to Australia, intending to nurse when I got to Australia. But I just didn't. And I took me a couple of months to kind of. I was quite ungrounded, I think, when I first got there and just not in a position to be to be a nurse like I had no desire to you know go into that hospital setting even though that was my intention I wanted to work part-time and and do Reiki and and healing stuff for the rest of it um but then I moved to Byron Bay to a backpackers lived in a tent for a year at the backpackers and started doing meditations for my accommodation and a few other things um to pay for my accommodation and started doing sessions there so my registration document, my nursing registration came through while I was living in a tent with all this freedom. <clears throat> and I, I just remember sometimes thinking about having the hospital bleep as a senior nurse. So you had responsibility for the whole hospital when you have the hospital bleep and f- comparing the two, the two lives from where I was in a tent. I didn't even have a set of keys. I had no car. I had no responsibilities. Um, and began earning my living really from from doing this work and and not wanting to do to do nursing and when my registration letter came through it was like I'm not going to re-register as a nurse because I don't want to do that anymore this is my life um and I learned a few different things like kinesiology theta healing um And it's been a really interest. I find all this stuff really fascinating and it's added a whole extra dimension to me of what the body is instead of, you know, the biomedical model, which is is great at what it is. But there's there's a whole extra heap of components, particularly energy um, that's missing from from that. Um, So that's kind of how I came to be be doing this work. And more recently, I've been getting into fascia of the body and we'll go more deeply into that later. But this has been absolutely fascinating to me because we never learned about fascia. Nobody really knew about fascia when I when I did my nurse training in the 1980s. Nobody really knew about fascia. And it's only really been in the last five, 10 years that so much more information is is coming through about fascia. 
and the very um, the very key part that it plays in our body. And I realized that I've been in fight flight for a long time and my body was used to being guarded because I think as a nurse, you're, you're not really relaxed in that role. It was renal patients, kidney patients that I dealt with. So, you know, they, they can be quite sick and go off quite easily. So you're always kind of ready for that to happen. Um, so, and my home life as, as well meant that I wasn't really that relaxed at home. So my body didn't, didn't know how to switch off. And the, the more recent time, like the last five years, in particular, the last four or five years since I've been back in the UK, I've been working even deeper with my physical body, which I have been since I first learned Reiki, but on a, on a whole different level. And the fascia is such an important key that was missing from that. I, I spoke a lot there. Over to you. Well, no, no, that's okay, because I, I'm just going to say to everybody now, thanks for listening, everybody. See you next time, because we've got <laughs> no time. <now. laughs> As I normally say to my guests, Christ, you don't have go on. No, but that's very interesting. And like you, I'm a, a Reiki master. Like you, I was very left-brained, which means very linear, very scientific, very particulate, very to the point, very needs evidence in chunks and stuff like that, you know. Um, I was a, a senior in biomedical sciences. I spent years in pathology. So I had a very, very general grounding in medicine and, you know, um, and, and those sorts of things. But behind the surface, right, I was cracking up, you know, because there was a whole part of me that wasn't being attended to. And that was my right brain, you know, and... Um, you know, my work now is mostly to do with emotions and, as you say, understanding the defense arousal response, which is basically the fight or the flight response. Denise, I didn't know I was so tense until I drank when it released all the tension and then all this energy just exploded like an atomic bomb. And that's why I became, without boring everybody again with the story, that's why I became addicted to alcohol because it released all this energy that was repressed, suppressed and compressed in me. And it gave me the feeling that I was free. But when I didn't have it, everything came back because it's directly associated to what programs and conditions I have in. And they would be sucked back in and I'd be back to being tense, back to being all scrunched up. Right. Now, over nearly 25 years ago, I wrote a paper. I sent you the paper anyway. You know, it, it went into the Journal of Advanced Nursing, actually. And what I did was I did some myofacial or myofascial trigger point massage to the head, neck and shoulders on, on, on people. And I measured how their heart rate responded to this. And it was clear that as they started to relax, their heart rate variability increased, which is a good thing. And they got into a more relaxed rest and digest response. So that was the start of mine. So I looked into something called um, the trigger point manual, which is basically two volumes of thousands of pages. And it talked about how the myo, which means muscle, fascia, right, how it's that that gets constricted and restricted. The muscle underneath is working perfectly well, but from a structure and a functional point of view, it's got no space to move in because the cling film, or as they call it in the saran wrap in the States, they'll call it, you know, the, the, the plastic stuff that surrounds all organs, the fascia, right? It was that really that was tensing up. Well, I couldn't get my head around that. How can that be tensing? Because it's just like a layer of plastic. I've since found out, and this is where I'm up to now, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll tell you some things in a minute that I haven't told anybody, but I can see now that the trigger points in the fascia are connection points for energy movement, but they're associated with a level of energy that's not accepted to Western medicine at the moment, although it's becoming more. But it's been known about in things like martial arts and yoga for years and years. And in martial arts, Chinese martial arts, they call it chi. In Japanese martial arts, it's called ki. In, you know, in, in Indian philosophy, it's in Vedic uh, philosophy, it's called prana. 
and pranayama in in canadian um american in uh, canadian indians it's called a land vital which means the vital life force you know it's called life force it's all the same thing and i call it vitality it's the movement of spirits if you like the Holy Spirit. Now, when I say Holy Spirit, think people think, oh, Christ, he's, <laughs> he's off on one of them. They're religious. I'm not, Denise, and you know me. I'm not. I'm, I'm totally irreligious, actually. But I believe wholeheartedly in the flow of this spiritual feeling. Why do I believe it? Well, I don't believe it. I know that it exists because I feel it. And like you, I had a Reiki session and it changed my life. It changed my perception. Because, because I can start to feel this like flowy stuff going on, you know, and, you know, and I don't fully understand it completely. I just trust it, that it will go where it's meant to go, you know, and I did Reiki and I did spiritual healing and it, I, for years and I, I went into trans mediumship, all these things that people generally don't know about me. But, you know, what this did was really it opened me up more as I let things go. Because I, I believe that people in this game, they realize that they don't have to get hold of anything anymore intellectually. They just have to let go of everything that they've always known, you know. And that's where I'm up to, really. But very recently, I've come across something called eggshell calcification of the heart. Have you heard about that? No. Okay. No, and it's interesting because I did cardiology the first ward I worked on was half cardiology, half renal. So I did spend two years in cardiology, but no, I've not heard of that. Well, it's relatively new and it's associated with pericarditis, which seems to be on the increase, right? And it's associated with the fascia. And it's also caused, there's an imbalance in electrolytes. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's right up my street because I've been studying this for ages and it's all falling into place. But what happens is, as you know, is in the fascia, there's almost different layers that glide on top of one another. In fight or flight, they become fixed. You know, I think it's called fixotropic, and there's posh words coming out here. But what actually happens is the movement of energy then is restricted, mm -hmm. right? And calcification and scarring starts to take place. This then limits the ability for the heart to expand to its full capacity and therefore energy levels are diminished as well. And in the, in the write up to this, I've mentioned that we may get on to talk about fibromyalgia, chronic myalgic encephalomyelitis, which is sometimes associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. And you know what, Denise, I can see now that things like connective tissue massage drinking the correct water, Tai Chi, Qigong, movement therapies, exercise, healing, all the things that I've been looking at and you, non-medical interventions are coming to their own in their own, you know, now. Because I honestly feel that people are becoming more and more aware of what they need to do for themselves. Yeah. Over to you. <laughs> Oh, so much there. Yeah. So the pericardium, um, I'm, I'm sure you said this, but just to say it again. So the fascia is the connective tissue of the, of, the, of the body and it's one organ. And the reason why, one of the reasons why it wasn't known about is because the research was done on cadavers who've been given formaldehyde and that makes, um, oh, I'm getting shivers, that, that makes the fascia hard. And obviously living fascia is different from the fascia of a dead body, even without the formaldehyde, because it's moving. It's constantly moving. It's constantly sensing vibration and pressure, and it's constantly moving. And there's an amazing video on YouTube um, called Living Fascia. And it was a doctor, I think he was in France, and he put in a fiber optic camera which is interesting because the fascia itself is like fiber optics. Um, and it was 20 time, 25 times magnification and it shows the living fascia. And this is the first time that we as humans have seen it unless it's been seen with, you, with your third eye. And it's beautiful and it, it moves and it bifurcates and it's like geometry. So for example, that might be one 
fascia, this might be another. And it's moving and there's liquid and there's solid and the liquid comes down the outside as well as the inside. And this is moving. So these can like lift up, they can move further on or they can attach to something else. And it's to whatever the body needs. And it even happens while we're asleep. This constant fascia movement is going on. So as you said, it surrounds all of the organs, the arteries and the veins, and it's got 250 million nerve endings held within it. So it actually is the biggest sensory organ of the body, and it's more sensitive than the eyes or the ears. Um, and the pericardium, as I was saying before, is actually fascia. So a lot of things like the tendons and the ligaments are actually fascia. They're a different form of fascia. And so this fascia that's around the heart, it connects directly to the lungs um, and it's receiving messages. And there's so much more to this than we don't know, like the emotions like that is still not really so much known. And I think the heart fascia link isn't quite known. I think the heart, the, the fascia brain link is a little bit more known. Um, but as with, with so much, we're, we're maybe not quite as on top of the, to me, the heart is the controller. It's more central in the body. And I feel that all the fascia links to the heart, probably all links to the brain as well, but it, the heart is in a more suitable place for it to all link to because it's right in the middle of the body. Um, so there's this constant monitoring going on. If you have pain in your muscles, you probably actually have pain in your fascia. There are six to 10 times more nerve endings in the fascia than there are actually in the muscle. And I believe though I'm not 100% sure that every nerve ending is surrounded by, by fascia. Um, I'm gonna say over to you at this point. I'm sure there's a lot more I can say, but I'm gonna no, say- No, it's brilliant to because we're sharing this now. My, there's all sorts of lights going off on my head because I think yeah. there's a quantum communication system that goes, you know, and quantum to me, it means um, multiple modules and, you know, different uh, energetic frequencies at yeah. different lay layers, you know. And I think that every single nerve fiber is, connect is connected because it's the Nardis and the meridians that actually send information from these quantum levels, which actually, and I call that a magnetoelectric effect. So in actual fact, the chi, if you like, which is the next level up, the chi moves the electrons, which then go through the nervous system, which cause the muscles to move. But if the muscle, right, is actually tightly wrapped in a plastic cellophane type thing, then it can't function properly. So the most important thing to do is, and this is why I say to my students, is to flatten out, right, the fascia or the cellophane. And then it's almost as if the muscle underneath goes, Oh God, thank God for that. So there's a, there's like an order, and this is what um, trigger point massage is basically. It's where you temporarily stop the flow of oxygen on the blood and then you let go and there's like a flushing effect that takes place. You know, it's well known, Denise, in American football that trigger points determine the success or the failure of the team. So they have trigger point massage or the, the teams that know about this. They have connective tissue and trigger point massage before the games in order to enhance the energy flow. And that's what I would call increasing the vitality index. Now, for anybody who suffering from pain in the muscles right and um, fibromyalgia you know can i just say about there's there's a link and i've clearly seen it in my own life there's a link to people who are highly sensitive i'm not talking about hypersensitive i'm talking about highly sensitive people because highly sensitive people are emotionally more sensitive and therefore, when threatened, they clamp up very much more quickly. So if you're born in this world to be a highly sensitive person as a way shower, I'm just going to say this now because, you know, I'm coming out of me neuroscience said, if you are here as a way shower and you've been sort of, you've landed in a very sort of harsh environment, right? 
generally speaking, what we tend to do, because this is my life as well, we tend to constrict and contract like a little anemone and we build a hard shell around ourselves. And that fits perfectly well with that eggshell calcification constriction around the heart. And that's why the stuff we talk about on the spiritual level about expanding the heart and overcoming fear, that to me is an understanding of how we can, um, the heart expands, the energy starts to express itself, but it's still constricted by the physical body, which needs to be smoothed out, move it, moved, and supplied with the correct nutrients. Over to you, Advantage Delaney. Yeah, definitely. I hear you on that, all of that. So, <clears throat> so I was, I've, I've had chronic pain in my body for years and years and years, and I received a diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Um, Actually, the day after I learned Reiki, it all happened in May 2001. Um, so, and I was, I felt quite lucky in a way to receive that diagnosis because I felt heard. The doctor that I went to see was the second rheumatologist that I went to see. And I knew that this woman gave diagnosis of this because a lot of other doctors didn't believe that it existed, that it was actually a thing. And I know that for many reasons, I pulled back my sensory, my senses from my skin because it was too much. It was too much for me as a nurse to feel what I could potentially be feeling. And I, there was also a bit of heart closing going on there too. So what happens in that in the long term is that this contraction of the fascia stays contracted, it stays in that constriction. Um, so even though I may have relaxed, my fascia wasn't relaxed. And there's many things which I'm, sh I'm sure we'll go on to to speak about of how we can actually relax our fascia. I just wanna share a little bit more about the fascia itself because I find this fascinating. I had yeah. to get that one in. Yeah. Um, really good. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. So the fascia itself, they call it tubes, and it is like a tube. But when you think of a tube, you think of an outside and an inside. And I don't feel that's how it is. I feel that the inside is the same as the outside, that it's actually all one. And there's a liquid aspect to it, but there's also a solid aspect to it. So that blows my mind to start with, that it holds both of those polarities, or what, what we might see as polarities, and works with that. And it holds collagen and elastin. And the collagen is the structure. And the collagen is actually a triple helix in there. So it's, um, and we, we know from, you know, my iPad's been held on a, on a tripod there. We know how, how strong that triple, that triple helix is. Um, so the liquid, that's why we can see the liquid on the outside as well, because it's not just like a tube. It's, it's a different structure from, from that. And it's all one. And I think if we could really zoom into it, which I'm sure we will in the future, we would, we would see all that. And it transmits signals as well. So it takes messages from your brain. It carries neurotransmitters to where it's needed in the body it carries hormones like insulin um, around the body. And there are new cells that were only found five years ago called telecytes, which are communication cells. So it really, it really is this massive missing link. And the fluid in there, some people <laughs> have, this, there are these cells called fibrocytes and when you put a bit of pressure on the fascia, the fibrocytes get to work and they release this like slime. So the fibrocytes are like slugs inside that release this slime. And it's very much like slug juice. You know, it's, it's very similar to that. It's kind of, it's this plasma substance. Um, so when you're having something like myofascial massage, which is really slow, Often with that, it's, it's bringing space to those areas where it's been constricted so that the fascia goes, oh, I'd forgotten that was there. <laughs> and then it moves into those spaces. 
And because it gets a bit fibrosed and a bit blocked or calcified, um, often the messages between the fascia and the brain are not actually getting through. So I've been doing fascia stretching and one of them is the IT band, which is the um, ischia tuberosity, is that the right name for that? Yep. That goes on the outside of the leg and it's kind of from your butt to your knee. And that helps us to stand upright as, as two-legged people. Um, and that is very thick and dense. And I was trying to stretch that. And, and what, you, what you do is have your legs out a little bit and you, 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 your feet are kind of like this. And you, you activate that muscle as if your legs are going to go like that, but they're not going to move. I couldn't do that. I was telling my legs to do that and they weren't doing it. The only muscles that I could activate were my inner thighs. I was like, that's really interesting. So I put my hand there, <clears throat> said to my fascia and my brain, this is what we want to do. And then it did it. And since then it's been able to do it fine. Um, but fascia stretching is a different kind of stretching and it's something that we can do ourselves. And I am the biggest advocate of fascia stretching. Um, I keep, I keep saying this lady's name, Erin Teets, T-I-E-T-Z, has a YouTube channel called Fascia Fix. She is incredible for teaching this and it's so simple, but it makes a massive, massive difference. Marvelous. Just one more quick thing. Yeah, yeah, so when you on. stretch the fascia in one part of your body, because it's one organ, yeah. you're stretching it everywhere. Yeah. So you feel relief in other parts of your body. Over to you. Yeah, the ITB, the ITB band is, is, is common for knee pain as well, simple things. Yeah. The inside one, the inside of the thigh muscle, that's called the gracilis, the grace muscle. And it's also known as the virgin's friend. Right. And sometimes that's tight in some people. <laughs> I'll, I'll, let, I'll let everybody work that out for themselves. But here's the funny thing is when you stretch these things, sometimes feelings emerge. I'm going to let you work these things out for the, you know. So when you release the tension in the fascia, the emotional component that caused the contraction in the first place starts to release if that happens, you're onto a winner, although it may be uncomfortable. But from a mindfulness point of view, just watch it. Don't try and analyze it. Watch it and breathe it away. So it's the outbreath that emotionally disengages as it floats away. Then you can watch it. And as it gets away far enough without being sucked back in, you can almost say to yourself, ah, oh, right, I can see why my fearful behavior was threatened there and why I've contracted in that area. And this is part of working with the inner child and all those sorts of things. You may even be working with eons and eons, right, of ancestral um, habits and behavior. But don't worry too much about that because, I mean, my, my hope for this pr program, if you like, is to keep it relatively simple. What else I was going to say is the plasma is important, but so is the water. And this is something that um, science won't have at the moment, especially medical science, that there is a fourth phase of water. There's a fourth phase of water and it acts like a liquid and a gloop as well. It's like gloop. And this is where this thixotropy comes in, you know, and really the pH is important as well. So can I just mention two things, pH and temperature as well, because obviously as you warm it up, because it's like a plastic gloopy, snaily, sluggy thing, it starts to move better. So connective tissue massage with warmth, right, is useful and stretching as well. But the pH thing is it's been clearly shown now, and this is the, this is the, the leap, this is the quantum leap, that frequencies of light are passed through the fascia and different frequencies of light, right, impact upon the fascia in different ways because they go down different communication pathways. And so that's why how everything's connected. And Denise, as you said before, this is called optogenetics. This is scientifically credible, this as well. And there are unscrupulous forces who can use different frequencies. Denise, this is quite important. Unscrupulous forces can use different frequencies to invisibly impact upon the skin and the fascia 
in order to its impact upon you as well. So becoming aware of the way that your body feels is a very, very deeply mechanism to neutralize any harmful stuff that's coming in. Now, I'm not going to clarify that because I don't need to, because people who know will know to look maybe into that. But it's called optogenetics, you know, and also um, th there's so much involved here. But water's involved. If your body's too acidic, there tends to be a calcification that goes down. So alkaline in the water, th there's so many different things. Uh, and this is how my head goes at the moment because it's flying in from different directions. But let me just say this about things. Sometimes I have like visions, if you like. I'm not, I'm not anything special, but sometimes vision and I go, as, um, as above, so below, okay. As in the macro, so in the micro and vice versa. So I got this. That, Joe, there's a perfect template for who you are that was in place on the day that you were born or even conceived, right? And if you look up to the sky and you took a snapshot of that moment, right, a square, like, a, you know, like the old photographs, you know, you get a square of that's the way it is. Well, that then descends and wraps around, right, and that becomes who you are physically. It takes in all the planets and all the stars and all those influences, and that's who you become. So it's a bit like that poem, The Desiderata, that we are stardust. I know I'm off on one here, but I can't help it, you know, because I think that that's really the connection, you know. And it's almost like your horoscope, if you like, or your, your 12 houses, right, are actually impregnated into your physical body and that's where the lessons come from as well so that's how i'm starting to see how these things may fit together it's only rough in my mind at the moment but over time it will refine more i don't know whether you can clarify that at all yeah yeah i, I love what you say there all of it um that's i got pinged a lot when you were talking about the different frequencies of of light um one thing that i'm getting nudged to mention is is vibration we mentioned before that fascia responds to vibration and your voice is a vibration when you hum instead of that sound going outwards the all the sound that you're producing goes into your body so when you hum you release nitric oxide which relaxes your fascia it relaxes your blood vessels so that's an awesome way to work with your fascia is to sing to it and not necessarily a song that you know, but whatever sounds want to come through your voice. So that might not even be in language that we know, it might be tones and frequencies. Um, but I find it really interesting to, to play with different notes and see which part of your body vibrates to that and which the fascia that you're working with seems to want. You have a feeling when you're humming, oh, that's responding well to that, and you might do it for a bit longer. Or it might be, that's awesome, but I finished with that note now. So then you choose another one. Um, and I also wanted to mention sugar, because you, 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 you mentioned all the other things like acidity but sugar can make the fascia a little bit sticky as well. It can make the, the fluid in there a little bit more viscous. Um, so yeah, sugars, sugars, and I'm a big cake lover. Um, <laughs> so you might see me wince when I mention about the sugar and, <laughs> and that. Um, but yeah, so, so tones and not holding back either when you're, when you're making sounds, just allowing whatever sounds want to come through, whether they're high pitched, low pitched. And, you know, a lot of people call this the language of, of light. And when we are, to me, when I speak light language or language of the heart, language of the soul, it's like the energy that comes through my hands and actually my whole body when I do Reiki, it's just another way of letting that energy through, but it's through my vocal cords. And it's quite an underutilized um, part of ourselves. And we're moving a little bit into, into sound medicine here, which is just incredible. And, you know, we could do a whole show just, just speaking about sound medicine as well, but it's very, very powerful. But we have that within us. 
you know, I, I do sound healing. I love to receive sound healing. I've got crystal singing bowls and a, and a gong and a few other bits and bobs. But you don't need all that because you've got your voice. And your voice is such a powerful... Um, the words that's, that's dropping in his tool, but it's kind of... <clears throat> It's so much more than than a than a tool that that just seems like, you know, to compare it to a hammer just seems the wrong kind of the wrong kind of word. But but you know what I mean. Over I do. You. I do. And, you know, we both share light language. And what I've been shown is I'll say what I've been shown is that the heart, generally speaking, when we don't know that the, the mind, if you like, or the brain overpowers the heart. Yeah. But as the heart starts to open, we, we move into that journey of self-mastery. And what I've been shown is that the heart really, as you said, is, is the central moderator, it's the boss, right? But it hasn't been because the head's been in charge, you know, which is compressing really. So as the heart opens more and more, the throat's important because there's another nerve which is important called the glossopharyngeal nerve. And the tongue and the root of the tongue is what we've used to repress stuff, you see. So, again, in traditional Chinese medicine and the work especially of um, Sifu Mantak Chia, right, they actually get their tongues and they pull their tongue out and opens the throat. So that starts to release any tension in the throat then. In, in, um, in some sort of chiropractic as well, they also do a lot of trigger point massage up here, uh, either side, because they, they talk about three different diaphragms. So they'll actually work on the diaphragm here. They'll work on here. They'll work in the ears. So th there's so many different things. Um, where was I going with this? Yeah, the light language thing is as well is that a lot of people, right, who've repressed and compressed and been very sort of people pleasing and, and sort of Uriah Heapish. Oh, yes, I'll do that for you. You know that one. You know, sometimes they well, they'll definitely find now as this shift of consciousness is coming in, they start to speak up more for themselves, you know, and I, I would advocate um, primal screaming, find out about primal screaming. It's where you basically go, go to a place somewhere where there's nobody around and basically just scream your leg off for an hour from your guts just let it come and what happens generally speaking is i do these groups you know people start to cry they laugh uncontrollably it's like all sorts of nutters on the beach you know and then we'll have like at the end of it for an hour so it's it's not to hold anything back some people cry some people laugh some people do you know at the hour we just stop right this is a bit like an osho meditation this we just stop and allow everything and all the energies then to assimilate. And finally, Denise, this is what I've been shown that I think is really important is the heart is connected to the 12 cranial nerves. Now, I've studied Kabbalah for a long time, and up till recently, we've only had 12 spheres of consciousness, right? But the two that have been obstructed have been de-restricted now. So we're back, if you like, to a 12-sphere tree of life, so that's why these energies are coming up and people are feeling, I've, God almighty, I haven't felt like this for ages and what's happening to me? If you're starting to feel emotions coming up and all sorts of weird and wonderful things coming up, please be assured it's a very, very positive thing. And I would suggest movement, expressing, dancing, massage, aromatherapy, tai chi, qigong, anything, whatever appeals to you, go with it. You know, and if you start to speak in what, what seems like strange voices and language, that's another very positive sign as well. I keep getting the heads to go into it here because I'm talking to you. You know what I mean? I keep getting the, oh, 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 hang on a second. <laughs> you know, let's just keep this to a relatively sort of scientific <laughs> neuroscience thing. Over to you, my love. Yeah, you mentioned dancing. So as you're speaking, I'm having to write things down because otherwise I'll just forget them. Um, and I wrote dancing down. So one of the things about our fascia is it likes variety. So if you're sitting at a desk all day and you, you're leaning forward like this, like the fascia will change the shape of your body because it's trying to help you. It's trying to make things more stable. Um, but one of the best forms of exercise for fascia is dancing. And that's not necessarily not with like overstretching at all because that's not good for your fascia that creates scar tissue on your fascia so I, in the morning i'm doing my fascia stretching i'm stretching the the lungs especially the ribs 
<clears throat> because that's another area that gets really quite solid. There is the IT band and a few other places as well. And then I put Dee's Top Tunes, which is my favourite playlist that I did on Spotify, have it on shuffle and I dance, not always to whatever it comes up with because I'm like, I really can't dance to that, but I, I let the universe basically choose what I dance to. And I dance... I let my fascia dance me and I let the music dance me through the fascia. And I, you know, there's, there's lots of like arms up in the air because I've been quite constricted down here. This brings joy into your world. It's a position that is associated with joy, putting your hands up in the air. And I dance like nobody's looking. <clears throat> And I don't really care. Even if I was dancing in my garden, I don't think I'd care anymore if anybody could see me because you just dance to whatever way your body wants to move. Even if you look a bit crazy, even if you're just kind of like shaking, which again is really good for your fascia because it gets those really stuck things out. But just dance and just let go. We, Without a drink inside us, we often don't dance. People seem to need that drink, that little bit of Dutch courage to be able to dance. But it's such an important thing that we have lost. So many indigenous communities still dance. They're barefoot, they've got their feet on the ground and they're connecting to the earth and the cosmos. And they're just letting their bodies run free through dance. Um, I wanted to put the vagus, vagus nerve into the conversation, but I'm going to throw that over to you because you know more about that than me. Well, the vagus nerve, it's, a, it's the symbol in the body, in my view, of the sacred feminine. You know, I think it's um, the vagus nerve controls the fight or flight response, uh, no, the rest and digest response. And for, for a long, long time, we've been under the control of the supposed masculine fight and flight response, which is very associated with ac external organs and stuff like that. The feminine is associated with the viscera, you know, and there's a phrase coming up now. It's called visceral tissue armoring. Right. And that's why when the fascia gets stuck, it's in a habit of defense, you see. And that's why now we're moving more and more now into an allowing, more nurturing process. The vagus nerve is magnificent. I see it as it's, it means the wanderer. And I see it as a sort in my mind. I always have the same picture. It's like a Bedouin princess. Right, who's going around, popping in all over the place to say, how are you getting on? Treat yourself kindly. So it's almost like going throughout our whole body because it's the longest nerve in the body. It's going throughout our whole body and say, oh, come on, Charlie, give yourself a break. You've worked too hard, you know. So, so it's all that thing again about balance, but it's associated. The way that we can um, enhance the journey of the sacred feminine is through understanding our breathing. And it's the outbreath that allows the sacred feminine to travel in better style, really. So outbreath is important. I mean, in the end, it's this is a dance between the masculine and the feminine. But I think initially we've got to allow the nurturing feminine to take over and to guide us. And if you can do that, and it, it gets a bit sort of um I, I speak I speak to my body and I especially speak to the sacred feminine part of me in my heart and in my soul, you know, and if you want to call that a prayer, then OK, it's a prayer. And I say, look, I'm not really quite sure what's going on here, but could you give us a bit of a clue on what I need to do next and then I leave it. And, and invariably, a thought will pop in maybe half an hour later, or I'll even get a movement, you know. And Denise, I've been walking down the street and I'm thinking, I must go down to that shop over there. And then I've got this feeling then, it's almost like my whole body has moved by itself to say, no, you're not, you're going to go left. And then you go a couple of hundred yards and you bump into somebody you haven't seen for years, you know. So that that's I've got that much faith and trust in this sort of spirit world guidance if you like you know um without getting too religious about it because I, I don't do religion but i do do spirituality you know whatever that means and i'm only just learning you know in, in 1998 i got a book it was it was this book it was called it's called vibrational medicine and it's by a dr richard gerber and if you can get a copy of that should be able to get them cheap now 
It's absolutely brilliant. And at the time, I was thinking that I wanted to become uh, a medical doctor. So I was invited for an interview. And a professor of anatomy said to me, he was interviewing me. He said, where do you see the future of medicine? Well, I'd been reading this book, you see. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. Well, I didn't know, you see, because I was awfully naive. I was thinking, oh, my God, we've been missing the point, you know. So I said to him, well, I think it's in the it's in vibrational medicine. He said, oh, what do you mean by that? I said, well, well, I said, it's really all about energy, frequency, vibration. I said, for example, if you chop a leg off a salamander, it can regrow its leg. I said, but a frog can't. I said, so it's understanding the energetic principles. Needless to say, I didn't get the, <laughs> I didn't get a position in the medical school. <laughs> However, I got them back because I made a big detour and I did my PhD in this subject. And now I'm hitting them with it everywhere I go, you know, just to go back to the heart and the 12 cranial nerves. The 12 cranial nerves then are work off electricity. They connect through the fascia, right, with the meridians and the nardis. So there's 12 meridians as well. Right. And then the 12 meridians, they they actually connect with the cosmos then and the 12 tribes and the 12 disciples. But the 12 spheres of the Kabbalah, to me, represent different frequencies, which represent different innate skills that are open to every single human being on this planet. Denise, I honestly believe this, that we're being given the opportunity now to do cross training through sound and light medicine and vibrational medicine to be able to open up all these portals and streams of consciousness. I haven't shared this so deeply in, in before, but this is how my mind is working all the time. And I'm beginning to see that there's abilities in the right brain and the left hemispheres of the brain, and that we've been sort of snuck into the left-hand side and kept there beyond our will so i think more and more people are breaking out now and using these innate resources to go forward in a different way and make the world a better place over to you <laughs> that book by richard gober is amazing that i bought that early on and i i like the fact that he was a medical doctor yeah. um so when i did my nurse training i didn't have a degree and before i left um nurses were being trained to degree level so at some point, because I was a sister and the, and the more junior staff were actually less, more quali I was less qualified than they were because I didn't have a degree. We all had to do our degree. Um, so I did this. Long story short, I, for one of my assignments, I, I did something on vibrational medicine. Um, and that book was really key for me. It was such, such an interesting book. And I've just bought a book called Sound Medicine by a Dr. Chowdhury. I can't remember her first name. I haven't started reading it yet, but she, she is a doctor from India who was living in the US, but she's gone back to India now. And they're actually doing a lot of research in India on sound. And I think the less westernized countries that still have Western medicine, like India, I, and I think Russia as well, I think they're going to be the countries that do a lot more of this research so it, it is starting to be done and sound for example um if you know what the frequency every, every cell in your body has a different frequency every cell in your body is singing but we just don't necessarily have the tuned ears to hear it at the moment although in sessions i feel like i'm starting to even though i may not consciously hear it as a note i can hear you can hear a frequency to to a certain point so if you know what the frequency of a cancer cell is if you put into the body that exact same frequency because the in interesting thing about sound is suppose this is like sound wave if you have the exact same sound wave it cancels out the sound and makes it silent so if you have that same frequency and put it into the body it will kill those cancer cells without damaging anything else and we're already using ultrasound in things like kidney stones so instead of um you know going in surgically they're using sound to break up kidney stones which is amazing so we're starting with this already but i i feel that sound is is really going to be the way forward with um with medicine 
a sound and light, as you say. Um, and electromagnetic, did, did I say in the beginning of this that the, the collagen has an electric charge and the, um, the fluid is the, is the mag magnetic side of it? So, so fascia holds that electromagnetic combination within it as well. I think the the masculine is generally seen as electric and the feminine as the magnet, you know, and that's why as the heart opens, because it's being driven by a feminine energy, it's a magnetoelectric effect. So it's the magnetism from the next dimension that's actually yeah. causing more because because we understand don't we nerves and electrons traveling through nerves medicine in, in its Western sense can get its head around that. But I honestly see that the, um, the future of medicine is really more inclined towards medical physics and the yeah. stuff i mean i'm developing something called chromato optogenetics i think we've talked about this before and the chromato is related to the chromatic scale on a piano which has got mm -hmm. 12 notes so there's the 12 notes representing the 12 spheres but the chromatic also means to do with light so what i'm being shown in my mind is i'm being shown that there'll be a, a frequency that represents if you like the albion template or the uh, the uh, adam cadmon it's called or you know the perfect um, original face smiling face of the universe call it what you like but the perfect human template both for masculine and feminine so underneath all the gunge or the shroud that we've encased ourselves in over eons of time these frequencies both sound and light will be able to chisel away at that and allow the real essential self to come through in order then to create a new world. You know, I mean, I, I know it all sounds like weird this, but I know in my heart that this is true. And um, I know also that medicine actually is starting to soften a bit now and listening to things because it's almost like come to the end of its solutions, you know, and it's always, it's looking now for out of the box type things. Well, we'll be laughing, won't we? <laughs> when the, when the invitors in for these talks and all that, we'll be laughing saying, we told you this years ago. Even so, the yeah, shapes. So much, well, so much. No, 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 you carry on, carry on. I was just going to say about the shapes of rooms as well. So geometry is really important. The fascia is, is geometric in its nature, but it's not as simple as it is a certain shape because it's always moving. Actually, just let me. Um, oh, yeah. So that is a little bit how the fascia looks, but that is almost like the microscopic level that's been blown up so that you can see it. But that gives you a little bit of an idea. But it's it's like a snapshot of it. It won't stay like that for, till the next second because it's already moving. Um, so I think it was Plato when he first had hospitals, they were they were sacred geometric shapes. Um, so there are certain shapes that are that are better for the body and, and the frequencies of which are better for the body. Even the colors, you know, painting the walls in different colors, having different kinds of light and, and maybe even maybe even sound as well. These, these are the ways forward. And, you know, when a room, when the angle is at a right angle, the energy gets stuck in the corners. So one of the reasons why hospitals are such depressing places is because the energy never gets cleared. So people are releasing all that emotion and it just stays there in the fabric of the building. But if the rooms were round, that would be the ideal because because that's how energy moves. Energy moves in a spiral. So that's the most free flowing shape um, for the energy to, to not be stagnant and to keep flowing. Um, and in, a, I don't know why I'm saying this, but in a pyramid, they've seen that there's like a double helix within a pyramid. Um, so that, that, that's a really potent shape to use as well. I know why you said that because I'm being guided, if you like, and I have done for many years by Imhotep, right? And he built the first step pyramid in Saqqara in Egypt. It was the first pyramid that was built, but the whole complex was basically a healing complex, which used tunnels and reverberating tunnels and corridors. And they used to lay people on the, you know, the the plinth, if you like, and they used to bombard them with all sorts of different frequencies of sound as well. So, yeah. you know, in, in a big way, I, 
I was I was fascinated by ancient Egypt and their medicine, you know. And Imhotep is apparently he's the sort of a precursor to Hippocrates. So it, all his information, right, was then transferred to Greek then, and then it's moved on from there, you know. So, so I, I know that's why you do that, you know. I mean, th there's absolutely so much um, things came to my mind when you were talking. There, I thought, God, I must mention that. I was thinking, no, no, we'll have to have another show. <laughs> <laughs> So just uh, we're, we're sort of coming up to time now, Denise, but just simple, practical things then. If you give a few and I'll give a few and uh, see see how uh, people respond to that. Um, oh, I don't know on top of what I've said already. I'll let you do yours and then I'll add. And can I, can I mention what I'm doing on Thursday with the... Um, so Thursday, I've got a session, an online session which is related to the heart to start with. I wanna go in deep with the heart so people can examine their heart and examine the energy of the heart and work with the energy and give to the heart what it needs to be more whole. If it's looking you know, damaged or bruised or shrunken or whatever, then we'll work on the energies of that to make it look plump and, and healthy. And also um, there will be sound and light language for that and also to connect the heart more fully with the fascia and there'll be sound and, and light language with that as well. So I'll, I won't put any more details in than that, but it's it's on my page. If you want more more details, it's on my Facebook page um, and it's Thursday at 630. So um, if anyone wants tickets for that, just just check out the event on the page over to you. Great. There's no such thing as coincidences because this morning, I was invited to a conference tomorrow. It was that quick, short notice. And it's um, it's to do with um, vibrational medicine. <laughs> it's to do with the technique called the Galileo technique. And it's uh, it's mostly, you. well, it's, it's used by the people that I know in pediatrics, you know. And basically, it's like a vibrating pad, right, which you can actually adjust and send different vibrations through the feet to different parts of the body and stuff like that you know so so that's tomorrow morning and the people who are going are from walton neuro and uh, walton neuro center you know and also from um coronary and cardiac care as well so i'm going to that a, a conference in the morning on this very subject you know so that that always just sort of shows me they are son this is the area we want you to look at you know so i would say more than anything else and this might sound very very simple but it's just to become aware of your breathing, you know. And I do this, I tap on my heart here just to sort of get a geolocation and come out of my head. So I get a feeling of tapping on my heart and I say, hello, is there anybody in there? You know, because this is my heart intelligence, you know. And as I've said, I think that it's the home of the sacred feminine, you know, like me big mama who really wants to look after me, you know. So I have that feeling going on with me. And so I get a sense of, okay, there's my heart. And then it's basically from the palm of my hand, just breathe in, two, three, four, five, stop, out, two, three, four, five, stop. And I do that for 10 minutes and I seem to sink down, my shoulders drop, everything relaxes and then it's almost as if everything opens up then and then I get the information on what to do for the day so that's the thing but the breathing in it it's called 0.1 cycles per second 0.1 hertz it's very important that you get the in breath and the out breath of the same length that would be the start now some it might be hard for you to do it that slowly so just try and slow your breathing down. Now, I have a little mantra, you know, where you say a little intonation, and it goes like this. Breathe in the, sh breathe in the light. <laughs> breathe out the shite. <laughs> right? It's that simple. You could make that a holy thing if you want to. <laughs> but this is Dr. Joe's mantra. So you're breathing in the light, and as you're breathing in, you're collecting all the gunge that's built up for years. And then you breathe it out and give it back to the universe so it can reassimilate it in some form, you know. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is get to know your body, get to know every single cell of your body and get to know all the bits of your body and love them, love them, you know. And as that lady said uh, who did that, uh, you can heal your life, right? I'm going to be rude again here, but I can't help it, you know. 
love your anus. <laughs> because so many of us have like sucked up and kept away from there. But, you know, I've had to sort of over the last 30 years is re-examine and explore these bits and pieces, you know, because every single cell works with every other cell. And if we've disconnected and isolated from certain parts of us for various reasons or teachings, then that may be part of the problem. So as I've said, if you're working in the underneath department and you start to relax and release things and stuff like that, just let it go and let it balance itself out. Over to you, Denise. That is a really good point. And that's been something that has been in my awareness recently as well. It, it's kind of like the part of your body that you are most disconnected from. It's, you know, there's a lot of shit goes down there. So, you know, it's, um, yeah, we can be very, very disconnected. And you're right. You're absolutely right. We have to love every single part of our body, everything. So even when you're in the shower, just, and, you, and you're washing yourself, do it with love. Thank your body, thank your feet when you wash the feet and thank them for, because they, they carry you around everywhere. Thank every part of your body, be grateful for every part of your body. And another thing, so when we learn Reiki, we're taught to put our hands on various parts of our body and bring the energy in. And even if you haven't learned Reiki, you can still do that. You can connect to the earth beneath you, connect to the cosmos, and intend for those healing energy frequencies to come through your hands into your body and ask your body, you, you just alluded to this, like speak to your body. When you've got a pain, ask your body what it's trying to show you. I was taught that when, when you've got a pain, there's something wrong and there isn't always something wrong, but it is your body trying to get your attention. So instead of just taking painkillers, ask your body what's what's going on what it's trying to show you and be really gentle with your body treat it like a newborn something or other that is is so fragile and delicate and just be really loving and gentle with with your body that's an amazing place to start thanks very much Denise this being great I'm sure loads of things will spark off this in my mind um so, yeah, it's about not thinking about it. It's about just doing it. Have a go. You know, get over yourself, right? Because <laughs> you will more and more. The more you express yourself, you think, what was I bothered about? You know, so get over yourself. Let yourself go and uh, let them have it. You know, there, there's the instructions, really. And just and let sing. it out. Let it sing out. Sing and dance. Yeah, sing, dance. <laughs> right? And just enjoy yourself. And find out what you love doing and do more of it, you know. Yeah. And that's that's it, really, you know, find out what works for you and do more and more and more of it like Forrest Gump until you get bored with it and then go and find something different to do, you know. So on that note, once again, Denise, thanks, love. We'll let we'll have another one of these further down the line, if you don't mind. And um, I'd love to. And um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And I hope you've got something from there. And next week's guest, uh, I'll be putting that up in a couple of days as well, uh, who will offer some more insights into maybe going forward so take it easy and may the force be with you and on that note toodaloo